Hey family, this is Pastor Mike. If you've been a part of this community for a while, you might notice something different. God has used the encouraging word mightily over the last two decades to advance his kingdom. And we're continuing that work under a new name, a light. We want to see a community and our lives a light for Jesus. Thanks for joining us. In the 1923 World Series, Babe Ruth was playing against the Chicago Cubs and they hated each other. Like they just couldn't stand one another. And so they constantly started talking trash. And finally, Babe Ruth, who's the greatest baseball player to ever live, decided to show that he was the GOAT. And so he took his bat and he pointed out towards the outfield fence and said, it's going there. And here you can see a picture of what happened. He hit it out of the park 490 feet. If it had gone any further, it would have gone all the way out of the park altogether. But it hit a wall and stopped. And from that moment on, people were like, he's the greatest baseball player to ever live. Because he called his shot. And today, we're talking about Jesus, the greatest person who's ever existed. And the thing that a lot of people don't know is that Jesus called this shot with the resurrection. You see, Jesus was well known as a preacher and teacher. People came from everywhere to hear him speak. And people were wondering, is this more than just a man? Is he more than just a good teacher? And so they'd ask him questions all the time. And they'd say, we want you to show us who you really are. And one day, some men came to him and said, Jesus, would you give us a sign, a miracle, to show us that you are who you say you are? Now, keep in mind that right before this, in fact, just minutes before, Jesus had fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and a few fish. He just had taken this little boy's lunch and fed a huge crowd. And they're like, yeah, that's cool. Show us something else. Like, do another trick, Jesus. And Jesus told them, he said, listen, because you're an evil and adulterous generation and you're unwilling to see the signs that I'm showing you, you're going to have to be content with the sign that I'm going to show you, which will be the ultimate trump card, which is just like Jonah, who is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. I will be in the belly of the earth and then I will be raised again. Jesus called this shot. He said, I will be crucified and then resurrected. And nobody really understood what he was talking about because the idea of the resurrection was just a radical idea. And we're going to hear today how radical it truly is and what that really means for us as people who follow Jesus. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures today, Matthew 27 is where we're going to be starting, verse 62. And what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through the story of the resurrection. We're going to move through it. We're going to talk about it. And we're going to hear it maybe for the first time because I think a lot of us have heard the story of the resurrection, but we actually haven't read it. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen what the people did when they heard it, when they experienced Jesus for the first time. So verse 62 says this, the next day, which followed the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, sir, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days, I will rise again. So give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come, steal him, and tell the people he has been raised from the dead. And the last description will be, the last deception will be worse than the first. Take guards, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. And they went and secured the tomb by setting a seal on the stone and placing the guards. So I think it's fascinating that the Bible records the skepticism that many people have about the resurrection. You see, Jesus had told people that he'd be raised from the dead. Everybody knew it. And so the people who engineered his death were really afraid that Jesus' disciples would come and steal the body. And then tell everybody that he was raised from the dead. And so they tell Pilate, who is the Roman governor of the area, they say, hey, Pilate, you know what would be really great is if we could like, make that not happen. As long as three days don't go by, we're fine. But like, could you like make sure that doesn't happen? So they sealed the tomb and they put a wax seal on it, put a huge stone in front of it, weighing several thousand pounds. And then they ended up uh, uh, putting an armed guard, probably 20 to 40 Roman soldiers outside the tomb to make sure that nobody could come and take Jesus' body. 
I just love what Pilate says. He goes say, and he says, make it as secure as possible, which is probably like the, the most failed plan ever because we know that that wasn't what happened, right? Jesus made it out anyway. Next passage, Matthew 28, verse 1. It says, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken in fear of him that they became like dead men. So our story picks up here now where two Marys and maybe some other women come to see Jesus. Now, there are several different women called Mary in the New Testament, especially those that follow him. So we know of at least three. We've got Mary, the mother of Jesus. We have Mary Magdalene. And then there's the other Mary. <laughs> the other Mary is uh, Lazarus's sister. Jesus was really close with her family, and he would come visit them regularly. And so you find these three women coming, and they bring spices and salts to prepare Jesus' body for his burial. Because Jesus died on the, in the hours right before the Sabbath. And so they, they put him in the tomb, but they hadn't fully prepared his body. And these women loved Jesus, and so they came to prepare his body for his death. Now, I think they were very sad as they were approaching, but they're also concerned because they don't know how they're going to talk their way past the guards and how they're going to get the, the stone to be rolled away because it's very heavy. But when they get there, they find that it's all different than they expected. The guards are all knocked cold. There's an angel there, and the, the tomb has been opened. And the angel says this to them, verse 5. The angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and indeed, he's going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb, with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them and said, greetings. They came up, took a hold of his feet, and worshiped him. Now, you find the angel telling the women to go tell the disciples, and the response of the women is twofold. One, they're filled with great joy. They're, they're excited to hear that Jesus has been raised from the dead. They're filled with hope by that, but they're also really afraid. They're like, what just happened? They're not sure what's going to happen next, and that's something that Jesus does with people. He's not what you expect. And today, you may come with a lot of expectations about who Jesus is, and you think you haven't figured out, and you think that you have a pretty good idea of what he can and can't do. But I'm going to tell you is that Jesus is unpredictable. He does things that you don't necessarily expect. And here, Jesus is raised from the dead, and that's unexpected. You see, nobody really saw that coming. Even though Jesus told them, they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe that's some kind of parable. But you aren't really coming back from the dead. And the reason for that is because no one came back from the dead then, right? And you probably don't know anybody that came back from the dead today. The idea of a physical resurrection was an outlandish idea. And sometimes I think when we look at people who lived in the past, we think that they don't understand how the world works because they don't have electricity, right? like, man, they don't, they don't know the world's round. They don't know America was here. Obviously, they were idiots. And they would believe things like the resurrection. But in Jesus' day, they didn't believe in the resurrection either. You know, they thought that when you died, it was just over. That's what the Sadducees thought. The Pharisees, who are the, the believers, that, uh, the followers of God, who are the, the, the religious leaders trying to really keep the law, they believed in a resurrection, but they believed that it was at the end of time, when God made all things new, when God restored all things and lines laid down with lambs. And so if you told them that somebody was raised from the dead, they would say, I don't believe that that is possible. That can't actually happen until God returns and changes everything. And then there were the Romans. 
The Romans and the Greeks didn't believe in the resurrection either. They believed in an afterlife, but it was very different than a bodily resurrection. They believed that your spirit just went to another place. So this idea, all of a sudden, where all these people are saying, we believe that we have encountered Jesus, that he's been raised from the dead, is a radically new idea that hundreds of people also, all of a sudden saying, we have seen him. We haven't just seen the empty tomb, the empty grave. We actually have touched him. We've hugged him. That's what these ladies did. They came up and they touched his feet and they worshipped him. So you find Jesus coming and proving himself to people, not just through something that someone else saw, but that an entire group of people saw. Often for many days, the Bible tells us that Jesus wasn't just seen on the resurrection day, but for 39 days. It's so over a month, he spent time with his disciples. So what do you do with that? Because you have eyewitness testimony of people who said, we saw Jesus. And I know that some people would think, like, well, maybe he just didn't die then. Like, if they actually saw him, the tomb was empty, maybe, maybe Jesus, like, figured out a way to switch who was on the cross, or maybe there was a way for him to, to like, get out of the tomb. And so there's a whole, like, concept out there called the swoon theory. Have you ever heard of this? The swoon theory is, is actually by, held by some serious scholars, but I think they're more interested in like their, their version of the, the facts than what really happened. Because the idea of swoon theory basically is that Jesus was crucified, but he wasn't, wasn't all dead. Like he was just mostly dead on the cross. And then when they put him in the tomb, he woke up there. He was like, man, that was rough. <laughs> he got up and he got out. Now, there's some problems with that. First of all, Romans were really good at killing people, and they crucified a lot of people, and they never let somebody off a cross alive. And the Bible tells us that eyewitness testimony from the people that actually put him up there, the Roman guards, centurions, saw Jesus' side pierced, and blood and water came out, which only happens when you're dead. So they stabbed him in the side, and water and blood came out, which means they pierced his heart sack. So he was dead. We know that. Everybody knows Jesus died. In fact, very few people dispute that. But the idea of him getting out of the tomb is even more ludicrous because as somebody who has just been flogged and then crucified, the idea of moving a 2,000-pound stone out of the way, which I'm trying to lift weights again. Like, let me just tell you, like 45 pounds, I'm like, oh man, that's a lot, right? Moving a, moving a huge stone out of the way from the inside and then fighting 20 to 40 guards unarmed. Man, I'm telling you, like, that's a miracle in and of itself. It's like saying Jesus all of a sudden became like Bruce Lee or Jason Bourne or the guy Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible, right? Like, hey, listen, I'm just going to go out and fight. What's more likely, though, is that Jesus really was raised from the dead. And the greatest reason for that is that the people that followed him began to worship him. They worshiped him. And you see that in the story we just read. The women come, they bow down, they touch him, and they worship him. Now, a first century Jew, or any Jew, you guys may know people who are Jewish who hold to that faith, they're not going to say that Jesus is the son of God or that he's God. And in Jesus' day, it was like that too. People were like deeply ingrained in this idea that there's only one God and that you can't see him or touch him and he's definitely not a man. And yet, all of a sudden, there are all these people who are saying, Jesus is God. Like, he's, he's God. Like, just like God the Father, he's God the Son. And he is fully God in every way. And these people aren't just like the, like, just random people who just heard this. It's like his brothers and his mom. Do you have a brother or a sister? Maybe you have like a relative? Ask yourself the question, what would it take for you to say that they were God? Just think about it. The Bible tells us that Jesus' brothers didn't believe that he was God at first. James and Jude, who actually both wrote books of the Bible, both those men tried to take Jesus away and get him committed because they're like, you're embarrassing the family. You're like preaching and healing people. Like, hey, just like slow down. And yet James becomes like the single most important leader with Peter in the early church. And the reason why 
the Bible tells us, is because James met Jesus after the resurrection. I'm telling you one thing that would make me like doubt my priors. You know what that would be? If my brother showed up and was like, boo, I'm back. I was dead. Guess what? I'm not anymore. That would change my mind. And it seems that that's what changed James's mind. And that changed the mind of everybody who interacted with Jesus during that time. And many of these people, from Peter on down, many of these people all went to their deaths because of what they saw, not what they believed. You know, if you, if you get together and you conspire and you come up with a, with a conspiracy and you end up like coming up with a lie and then you try to push it out on people who are unsuspecting, you can do a lot of things, but one of the things you're not going to do is you're not going to die for it because you knew you made it up. But over and over and over again, people like Philip and Stephen and John all went to their death saying, you can do whatever you want to me. You can kill me. You can hurt me. But I'm not getting on Jesus' bad side. Because he's the one who can let me out. And it's the proof of people believing in the resurrection that has changed everything. Because at its fundamental core, what Christianity is, is we are a resurrection religion. That's what we are. We are about the resurrection. The resurrection is the central piece to what we believe. It's what Jesus said. This is how you can know who I am. It's me calling my shot and then doing it. The resurrection is the center point of everything we believe. It's not going to church or doing good things or knowing your Bible. Ultimately, it's identifying with Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection that defines us. That Jesus did live. He did come. He gave his life for us. When we believe in him, he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness so that we can be resurrected ourselves. Because this is what we're celebrating today, y'all. I want you to just like lean in, okay? This is what we're celebrating. We're not just celebrating Jesus' resurrection. We're celebrating yours. That's what we're celebrating today. The fact that Jesus Christ has come so that you and I who deserve death can be raised to life. And we, when we die, we will be raised from the dead. That is the hope that we have. That we are people who are going to be resurrected. And that resurrection now is coming to life within us. And if you don't believe me, look at what 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19 says. It says, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only. That means if you just want to follow Jesus today, just for what now? We should be pitied more than anyone. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. The Bible says Jesus Christ's resurrection is a taste of what's coming for you. You, when you believe in him, get to enter into it, which means... Jesus is about resurrecting people. He resurrects broken parts of your story, resurrects parts of your story that you thought were dead, things that you're ashamed of. Jesus wants to bring death to life because death isn't a finish line. It's a starting point. We move move from the point where everything is dead and then we find life. So some of us need to get to a place where we're going to say, I'm not going to do things anymore. I need to put these things to death so that I can find life. Some of us, when we look at our future and the things we're holding fast to, we need to say, I'm going to put those things to death. Why? So I can find life. Because ultimately, my life is about Jesus. And he gives me the hope to be somebody who's courageous, even when it seems scary. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who was living in London at the time of the Nazi rise, decided to go back to Germany to raise up a church that would oppose Hitler. And he took over the confessing church, spoke out against the Nazi party, eventually was imprisoned, and Hitler hated him so much that on the day that that Europe was liberated and the Nazi empire came to an end and Hitler took his own life, he had it arranged for Bonhoeffer to die. And as they were coming for Bonhoeffer to take him away, he wrote this. He said, this is the end. For me, it's the beginning of life. See, I think he knew something about what the gospel ultimately is about. It's about being people 
who live fearlessly because God has already shown us what really matters. What matters is knowing him, identifying with him, being his. That's what really matters. And the way that you get there is by having a restart. You know, all of us need to have a restart sometimes. I mean, I don't care if you've been a Christian since you're like a young child. I don't care if you've been following Christ for years or you don't know Christ yet. But all of us need to restart. And that's what the resurrection promises us, that you can start again. You can start new. You can start fresh. I, I play video games with my kids. Um, I don't know if you play video games. Maybe you played them when you were younger. One of the best parts of video games is that when you don't like how it's going, what can you do? Push power, start over again, respawn, right? We're not talking about reincarnation here, but you do get a restart, just like Mario Kart. Like if you're like driving and you're trying to win the race, what happens if you drive off into the weeds? Well, you can just start over. That's great, right? Here you go. That's what you get to do if you follow Jesus. Man, you can have a terrible moment. It doesn't define you. You can like fail over and over again. It's not the end for you. Why? Because you're a part of the resurrection and your destiny ultimately is hidden in Christ. Which takes us back to the most important question you can ask. You know, when Jesus first started talking about his death, he did it in the context of a man named Lazarus, one of his best friends. And Lazarus was somebody that the Bible tells us Jesus loved. Like they were really close. And Lazarus got sick one day. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus waited to come see him. He could have gone earlier, but because he loved Lazarus, which is a really crazy phrase, because he loved Lazarus, he waited to go see him. And then Lazarus died. And a lot of us don't like to wait on God. We're like, God, where could you possibly be if you're going to make me wait on you. But when Jesus showed up, his sister Mary, the same Mary that came to the tomb that first Easter morning, came to him and said, Jesus, why are you wait? If you had come, you could have healed him. And Jesus tells her this in John 11, verse 26 and 25. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says, I'm life. I'm the resurrection. If you believe in me, you will never die. That's a really bold statement, isn't it? But he finishes with a question. He says, do you believe it? And I want you today to consider how you would answer that question. Do you believe that he's the resurrection and the life? That is the most important decision you can make. Do you believe that he is who he said he is? That he can do whatever he wants? Do you believe that? Mary did. She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God who comes into the world. She declares who he is, as clear as anybody in the scriptures. She says, you are the Messiah, the one we've been hoping for. You are the Son of God. You are just like God. You actually are God, and you've come into this world. And she had the answers. I'm betting those those answers were questioned a little bit when she had to walk to the tomb that first Easter. But I wonder if deep down she's saying, Jesus told me that he's the resurrection. He told me he's the life. I wonder, I wonder if he's coming back. And as she walked down that path, she saw that what he said came true. You know, to you, I think one of the best things you can do is ask that question. Do you believe it? Who wants to respond this way today? You you got that card, right? There are four letters on it, A, B, C, and D. And I just want everybody to respond today to the message, to this question, do you believe it? And each one of these numbers are tied to a statement, which is kind of where you are. 
And there's no judgment wherever you are on this. So I just wanted to give you a chance to kind of respond just like really clearly today. So the first is this. You may go, I already know God. And today I want to go deeper in my relationship. This is probably a lot of you today. You respond this way. You say, I know God. I love him. I, I've given him my life. I believe, just like Mary believed, I am in. And my invitation to you, if you were able to say, yeah, I'm going to do A, is to say, you know what? I want to go deeper this year. I want to go deep. I want to know God even more. Apostle Paul says, my one thing I desire is to know him and the power of his resurrection. Like, maybe that's you. Like, I want to know that power. I want to see things that were dead come to life in my life. I want to experience that. I want that. If that's you, I pray that that would be your prayer. That you say, I believe that I can see that happen. There's others in the room who you're going to circle B, which simply means that you want to know more. Maybe you came with a friend. Maybe you've been a regular attender. You started coming over the last year. And you have a lot of questions about what it looks like to follow Jesus. We would love to help you. We don't know all the answers, but we've been walking this path for a little while, and it's been really good. Sometimes it's been hard, but it's been good. And we'd love to help you answer the same questions we asked. And so if that's you, you want to know more, just fill that in. Make sure you leave your, your card on your seat when you leave, and we love to just follow up with you. There's a third group of people in the room that you may be hearing this and you know that your life is not really Jesus's and you want to give your life to him today. You've been waiting for this moment. You've been on the fence, but you've heard the evidence and you go, man, I do want to follow Jesus. I want to have a life like that. I want to believe these are the resurrection of life. And that may be you today. And you may say, I'm going to circle C because I want to give my life to Jesus. And if that's you, we'd love for you to come talk to somebody afterwards you can pray with me, I'm going to pray in a minute. You can pray alongside me. But it's an easy way for you to take a next step to say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. Because here's the deal. I grew up in church. I walked an aisle like five times just to make sure. But my heart wasn't really all in. Like I had things I was holding closer than Jesus. And that might be you today. You might say, I've been 98% or 85% in, but I want to be 100% in. Follow Jesus with all my heart. It's the most important decision you can make. So if that's you, circle C, come talk to somebody, leave a card, pray, give your life to Christ today when I pray in just a minute. But there's still a third group of people, and that group of people are people who don't expect to do that. And we're, we're not going to shame you in any way, but if you don't ever expect to give your life to Jesus, you can circle D. And here's the thing. I think I was there several times in my life. You know, you... You might be at a place where you're like, I just have questions. My questions are so much bigger than my certainty. I don't know if I'm ever going to get there. <laughs> Man, maybe I've had too much trauma or it's just been too hard. I just I believe in other things. And listen, if that's you, we get it. But maybe God might capture your heart someday. And so this is the challenge I want you to consider. Is there something that God would do in your life that would change your mind. Perhaps you need to write that down. Say like, this is what it would take for me to change my mind about God. And I would just say, give God a chance because he's surprising. He might surprise you in a way you've never imagined. And next year you might be going, I'm team A, I'm all in. So I wanna pray for us as we close out, Jesus, Right now, as people are filling these out, A, B, C, and D, I pray for those who said, A, that I, want to, I already know Jesus, and I want to grow in my faith. God, I pray that this year would be the year that they have a major breakthrough in their walk with you. This would be the year they feel even closer to you than they've ever felt before, that this would be the year of the most joy and fruit that they've ever had in their life. For those who have questions, God, I thank you for that. And I pray that they would follow up. They'd come talk to me or one of our other leaders and they'd say, I want to know more. For those who've said, I want to trust Jesus, if that's you today, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer in just a second, the prayer of confession and faith. But the fourth group, those of you guys who are still questioning and have doubts, I just want to tell you, you're in a safe place because we have those two. And if you don't expect to trust Jesus, 
we'll love you anyway and hope that someday God may change your mind. But those who want to choose today, I'm just gonna pray. If you wanna give your life to Jesus, just pray this with me. Jesus, I know that I have stuff in my life that you're not happy about, that you have seen and I've sinned and I've messed up. Today, I don't want that stuff in my life anymore. I don't want it to define me. I'm gonna give it to you. Forgive me. And Jesus, I'm telling you right now, I'm all in. Whatever it takes, no matter how far, no matter what it costs, I'm in. I wanna follow you and I want the resurrection to be the defining moment of my life. If you prayed that prayer, God has changed your life. And I encourage you to tell somebody. You can even tell me right now. If you pray that prayer in this room right now and you wanna tell me, you can raise your hand. Would you raise your hand if you did that today? Okay, I see you. Anybody else? Trust Jesus for the first time, I see you. Anybody else? Okay, I see you. Here's the beauty. This is a day of life, I see you. Amen, I see you. This is the day your life just changed. Let me pray, Jesus, thank you for these lives that changed today. Lives that have experienced the resurrection. I pray that you feel it right now. Feel your grace and your goodness. We love you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today. Please hit subscribe to be notified when we share new uplifting content that will encourage you and help you grow in your faith. And click the link on the screen to get connected and support how God is using this ministry to bless people across the United States and help us with our mission to create a community, a light with Jesus.